Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again. Today we're going to be looking at Goldfinger, the book from which one of the most iconic and popular movies in the franchise was based. So, does the novel reach the dizzying heights of fun and adventure that the movie does? Well, I mean, no, but you know what? It's still a pretty good read. So let's talk about the plot. I really love the start of this book and how Bond becomes involved in the story. He's chilling at Miami airport in between flights and then this American businessman comes up to him and says, Now I know you! Oh no. Okay, he doesn't say that exactly, but he does reintroduce himself to Bond as Mr. DuPont. And Bond had met the guy previously in Casino Royale several adventures ago. He was one of the people playing cards at Casino Royale when Bond had to you know, rumble Le Chiffre. And I must say, I'm appreciating the little references to past Bond adventures in these books, and there's quite a bit of that in Goldfinger. Mr. DuPont asks for Bond's help in rumbling a uh, Mr. Auric Goldfinger, who DuPont is convinced is cheating at cards and stealing his money. Much like in the movie, it turns out that Goldfinger is using his assistant, Jill Masterton, to spy on his game with Mr. DuPont and feed him information about the cards in play, and so on. Bond tells Goldfinger to pay the money back to Mr. DuPont, and he takes Jill with him. They have a train ride and a little dalliance uh, before parting ways, and Bond returns to London. Where, would you believe, M tasks 007 with investigating Goldfinger, suspecting him of smuggling gold. There's also some stuff here about Goldfinger working for Smirsh, because obviously Fleming can't conceive of a villain that isn't foreign or working with the Russians and odd-looking, so I do actually quite like Goldfinger's physical description, though, actually. Uh, Fleming mentions that he has a tan, and the idea is that the guy is so, like obsessed with gold that he has changed his physical appearance to make him look like he's made of gold, which is just so crazy and awesome. I love it. Anyway, we have a few pages um, all about gold smuggling, and Bond receives quite the lecture from a Colonel Smithers who works at the Bank of England, and then Bond manages to organise a round of golf between himself and Goldfinger. It's very similar to the movie, actually, and Goldfinger tries to cheat, and Bond eventually foils his attempts and wins. So after the match, Bond is invited back to Goldfinger's mansion, and I will say, like, I really love this whole part of the book. Goldfinger goes out and leaves Bond alone in the mansion, and Bond is, like, snooping around and doing some investigating, and it turns out, though, that Goldfinger has installed cameras around his mansion, and so Bond discovers that and uh, manages to destroy the footage and puts the blame on Goldfinger's cat, uh, for the reason why no footage comes through. Um, and Goldfinger retaliates to this by giving the cat to his Korean manservant Oddjob to eat for his dinner. Yeah. Oddjob in this book also has a deadly bowler hat, which I was actually quite surprised about. I thought that was purely going to be a, an invention for the movie. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting to see Oddjob in this book at all. For some reason, I thought that that character was purely a, purely a creation for the movie. Anyway, after all this, Bond leaves the mansion and heads back to MI6, where he is given an Aston Martin DB Mark III, and um, again, not something I was expecting in this book. I, you know, thought he just drove Bentleys in the book, and that was it. Uh, and Bond tails Goldfinger with the car, and uh, he follows the villain and his manservant to a warehouse in Geneva, where he learns, of course, that Goldfinger is smuggling gold by melting it down, assembling it to his Rolls Royce, and moving it around... Um, moving around the world for profit. It's at this point of the book that Bond meets Jill Masterton's sister, Tilly, who is out to kill Goldfinger and tells Bond that Goldfinger actually killed her sister Jill by painting her entirely in gold. And I love that the book goes into a little bit more detail about this in the movie. Like, painting women gold is actually like a perversion of Goldfinger's. He like gets prostitutes and paints them gold, uh, not to the point of skin suffocation but then sleeps with them, presumably, and that's just so weird and creepy. Up to this point, I'm amazed at how closely the plot is resembling the movie. For some reason, I believe that Goldfinger was the first film in the series that varied quite wildly from the book, so all this has been quite surprising, and I've been enjoying all the extra little bits of detail and stuff, and even though it's very similar to the movie, I'm kind of loving it. But it is around here that things start to deviate massively. Bond and Tilly are captured, and she isn't killed at this point, but Bond is tortured. He does have a, you know, a deadly 
implement coming up between his legs, but in this case it's a it's a circular saw, not a laser. But Bond gets out of this situation not by mentioning Operation Grand Slam or anything like that, but offering to work for Goldfinger, and Goldfinger takes him on as his secretary? It makes sense that Goldfinger spares Bond's life in the movie, given that Bond explains he will be replaced and there would be increased suspicion uh, if MI6 thought that Bond was dead for whatever reason. Here, it's just he and Tilly end up working as Goldfinger's secretaries. And I'm waiting for the twist. Like, why did Goldfinger opt to keep them alive? You know, there must be more to this because surely Goldfinger couldn't just, you know, spare their lives because he needed an extra couple of people to do his paperwork. But sure enough, that's it. He just wants them to work for him, which is so weird. But anyway, Goldfinger takes them both to the United States, uh, where they're privy to a meeting that Goldfinger hosts with a bunch of gangsters uh, to ask for help with his Operation Grand Slam, which is to just steal the gold from Fort Knox. Uh. Um, but this includes the Spangled Mob from Diamonds Are Forever and Pussy Galore, who is the leader of a bunch of lesbian criminals who are also involved in the heist. Goldfinger doesn't tell the gangsters every detail of his plot, but Bond does find out that Goldfinger plans on killing everyone at Fort Knox. Uh, the crime lords only believe that they're going to be put to sleep with, a, you know, a sleeping gas. And as such, Bond writes a message in a bottle and sends it out into the world and hoping that someone will find it and send it to Bond's mate Felix, who will then come and provide assistance. It's a huge stretch that that would work, uh, but apparently, what do you know, it does. Sure enough though, the baddies and Bond and Tilly get to Fort Knox and all the soldiers around the area are just playing dead and then they all come up and then there's a, a battle ensues, a very short battle, admittedly, and um, Tilly is killed by Oddjob around this section in an absolutely absurd fashion. So Tilly's a lesbian in this book and uh, Bond is dragging her away in the midst of battle, away from the danger, and she's got a bit of a crush on Pussy Galore and she's like, she's being dragged along and then she's like, no, 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 I don't want your help, I want Pussy, Pussy will protect me, and Bond's being like, don't be stupid, you stupid girl, and it's at this point that Odd job throws his hat and kills her, and um, that's how she exits this story, which is really weird because she just kind of hangs around for most of the middle section. I thought she was going to be the main Bond girl for a while, but no. But Oddjob, Goldfinger, and the gangsters manage to escape, and then Bond is left at Fort Knox with Felix, and they have some pally moments. There's a chapter where they're just, like, bantering back and forth, and that's kind of nice seeing these two pals together again. While waiting for his flight back to England, Bond is drugged at the airport and wakes up on a plane with Goldfinger, Oddjob, and Pussy, and they're all being flown to Russia. Well, it turns out that Pussy doesn't fancy this idea very much and switches to Bond's side. Uh, then our hero deliberately breaks a window on the plane, which sucks out Odd Job in a very graphically detailed passage. And then there's a brief scuffle with Goldfinger before Bond apparently goes truly berserk for the first time in his life, according to the book, and strangles Goldfinger to death. After this, Bond instructs the flight crew to land and plane near the Canadian coast, where Bond and Pussy are then rescued. All of this climax is handled too quickly. I mean, so much action happens in literally the last three chapters of the book. We hardly spend any time at Fort Knox at all, and it just feels like Fleming once again reached his own word count limit and was like, okay, let's wrap this up quickly. There's a friggin' plane crash in one of these passages, and it's just like dealt with like so quickly. It's just like, oh yeah, and then they're rescued and, you know, that's it. Moving on. There's a little end coda with Bond and Pussy, and one of the cringiest things I have ever read. Bond turns Pussy straight, and it's, it's revealed in a few lines that... Well, well, actually, let me just read this bit to you. He said, he being Bond, They told me you only liked women. She said, I never met a man before. The toughness came back into her voice. I come from the South. You know the definition of a virgin down there? Well, it's a girl who can't run faster than her brother. In my case, I couldn't run as fast as my uncle. I was 12. That's not so good, James. You ought to be able to guess that. Bond smiled down into the pale, beautiful face, he said. All you need is a course of TLC. So yeah, she was raped as a child and that's what turned her gay and Bond just so happens to be the first real man she has met, so now she's happy to turn. 
it would be annoying if it wasn't so cringily presented. I think the best Bond books end when he actually isn't romancing a woman by the end coda. Fleming just cannot do the romantic stuff. But for all my griping about The Last Third, I actually really enjoyed the experience reading Goldfinger. So let's talk about the characters a bit, shall we? Starting with, of course, our main man. I do really like Bond in this story, and he starts off on a really interesting foot. He's musing about a Mexican goon that he was dispatched to kill before the events of the novel. He's quite moody and cynical, and I think that's how I like him best in these books. And this is when his he's musing about this particular assassination, and then Mr. DuPont comes and gives him the, the plot. Also of note, and something that runs through this particular book, is Bond's sense of humour. I can actually see reading this where the filmmakers were inspired to give Bond all of his quips and such, because while not as good as the movies, uh, Bond does have some funny moments here. Most of them are to do with Odd Job and Bond kind of taking the mickey out of the henchman, which is okay. I just don't think that Fleming has much of a sense of humour, and the films do the, the quips and the one-liners much better than Fleming ever did. Bond's still his crusty old nationalistic self, of course, and most of Goldfinger's employees are Korean, and that obviously irks Bond quite a lot, and he has some thoughts on the subject of homosexuality too, but... Okay, well, well let, let's get into that, shall we, and talk about the supporting characters. Despite not sleeping with her, Tilly Masterton is the female character with the most to do here. Actually, most to do. Uh, she hangs around for the longest anyway, let's put it that way. She's very cold with Bond and all that kind of stuff, but of course that comes down to the fact that she's a lesbian. Bond boils lesbianism down to sexual confusion, attributed to women's suffrage, as he puts it. It's more just Fleming being his usual self, and as I feel like I've said in these videos more times than I thought I would going into it, I know that I'm not going to read terribly socially progressive material here, but still, some of this stuff is just so without irony, and I suppose it's that lack of irony that makes it palatable in a way, because it's just so silly to hear these incredibly, you know, bigoted views based on nothing. Like, yeah, of course Fleming just thinks that lesbians are just a good challenge for straight men. But it's specifically how Tilly's sexuality leads to her downfall, Bond running away with her and she cries that pussy will protect her, <laughs> metaphor anyone, and it's that hesitation of going with Bond that gets her killed, and it's just so stupid. But regardless, I actually like Tilly, um, and though I resent the way that her death is staged, I think she's a cool partner for Bond for much of the adventure, and I actually wish that... I kind of wish that her and Pussy ended up together at the end of the book instead of Bond. I would have preferred that vastly. Then, of course, there's Goldfinger, who is just an absolutely awesome villain. For my reservations about some of the story aspects, he is fantastic. Everything about him is golden. His hair, his tan skin, his car, his cat, and I love that we get more detail about the whole him painting women gold thing. It, it's just so weird and pervy. It's ugh, it's great. Or Job is as quiet here as he is in the movie, so there isn't really much to say about him. He's Goldfinger's heavy, and Bond gets some digs in about him, and he has his cool hat, but everything that the filmmakers and Harold Sakai did for the movie just works so much better there because obviously it's a visual medium so he can have a presence there that he can't have here. Glad that they left the whole cat eating thing out of the movie though and uh, you know glad they left all the old racism out as well. We can add Koreans to the very long list of things that James Bond dislikes along with the Russians, the Chinese, Germans, pretty much anyone who isn't a straight white Englishman and quarrel. And then we have the iconic character that is Pussy Galore, or rather here the iconic name. I don't know if there's much space really for her to have much character development because she appears surprisingly late in the story, and this is something of a disappointment is she'd have been fun to have around for a whole lot longer. She's tough talking and very sassy, but much like Tilly, I just feel like she's there so Fleming slash Bond can pontificate about lesbianism and how all they need is to meet a, a real man and they'll fall head over their heels. My next point is kind of linking back to talking about Bond himself, but this surprised me that the novel version of Bond is being held up at this point as 
a peak of masculinity, because I've never really thought of him as being especially macho or virile in these stories. He's certainly evolved as they've progressed, and don't get me wrong, like, the trials that Dr. No put him through in the last book, you know, you would need to be, you know, a Superman to survive that, or at least at some kind of a physical peak. But prior to that, he's just sort of this fussy, opinionated, not terribly attractive, described Englishman who is, you know, has great willpower to withstand torture, but isn't necessarily presented as a perfect specimen of virility. So I guess I'm just surprised that the presentation of him in these books has come to that. He is a macho, great hero now. So yeah, for the most part, I was surprised at how similar the book and movie are. Except for the final third, the movie is a pretty faithful adaptation, but it does what all good adaptations do and improves on the original source material. It's things like, you know, Bond himself discovers the gold-painted Jill Masterton in the movie, um, and rather than hearing about it secondhand, and, you know, actually going inside Fort Knox instead of just hanging around outside, Bond saving his skin by dropping in a mention of Operation Grand Slam rather than offering to work as Goldfinger's secretary, and so on and so forth. It's just a much better way of experiencing the story to watch the movie Goldfinger rather than read the book. That whole secretary thing. I mean, why would you... Oh, I'm going to kill you, Mr. Bond. Could you imagine if they did that in the movie? Any last words, Mr. Bond? Yes. Do you have any paperwork that needs filing? I don't think that reading Goldfinger is as great an experience as watching Goldfinger, but it's still a great read and very much recommended. But you'd come to it later on. There are definitely better Bond books to get your start with. So, now I'm exactly halfway through the Fleming Bond novels, and I'm actually quite sad about this, especially as I know that what's coming up is two short story compilations and one book where Bond barely even features. So, I only really have four true Bond novels left to read, and I kinda don't want it to end, but we must keep on going, and next time I'll be looking at the first short story compilation in the series. For your eyes only. Join me then, Bond fans, so long for now.